morning, Sabbath, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray for your light to shine here upon our hearts and minds this morning. We pray that we would see ourselves more clearly. We pray that we would see you more clearly. And that we would love you because you are the light. Speak to us, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I left as a student missionary to Guyana, South America, my sophomore year of college, I'd heard that you could tell how long a missionary had been overseas by the food they ate. I was told that if a missionary found bugs in their food and threw the whole dish away, they hadn't been there very long. If they found bugs in their food and just simply picked them out, they'd been there a little longer. If they had found bugs in their food and ate it anyway, they'd been there longer still. And the missionaries who had been there the longest would go hunting for the bugs and add them to their dishes <laughs> for flavoring. Well, it turns out there's some truth to this saying. I remember I'd got there to the village of Kimbia, um, out there in the jungles of Guyana, uh, just a, a very simple, humble village. At that time, there was no electricity, no running water. And I remember we were all sitting in our living quarters, which uh, when we first got there was kind of this open-aired pavilion with um, walls that just came up to my waist that, that went around it. And we were sitting there, um, it was nighttime, we had these kerosene lanterns on, and we were eating guavas. Uh, it was uh, guava season, so the guavas were ripe, and we had picked a bunch that day. People had also brought us baskets, um, and we could, there were more guavas than we could ever possibly eat. Well, as we were eating the guavas, um, we realized that some of them had worms. And so we'd take a guava, and instead of just chomping on it, we'd slice it in half, and we'd hold it up to the, to the lantern light to see if it had worms. And if it had worms, of course, you, you threw it out. We hadn't been there very long. Well, there was a missionary who had been a missionary for many years. His name was David Gates. He was kind of in charge of the whole um, operation there in Guyana and other parts of South America. And he had flown in earlier that day, um, landed... Um, landed his plane, and he was coming just to see how things were doing, and he was there eating guavas with us. And um, at first, he just watched us kind of uh, cutting these guavas open and looking very closely to see if there were any worms in them, and then throwing away the, the wormy ones. And it, he got some guavas, and he reached over to the lantern right next to him and just turned it off. And then just in ignorant bliss, started eating every guava he could get his hands on. <laughs> Well, this was a shock to me. <laughs> the question I had is, if you turn out the light, do the worms go away? The more serious question I want us to think about this morning is if you hide from the truth, does it disappear? And this morning, I want to talk with us about this very unique human trait of pulling the wool over our own eyes, of fooling ourselves, our incredible knack for crafting for ourselves our own truth of our own choosing and religion of our own making. Perhaps the best story of this in the Bible is found in 2 Kings 22. We're going to turn there in just a minute. And we'll see in that story someone who fits the description of John chapter 3, verse 19 perfectly. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. So turn with me in your Bibles, 1 Kings 22. We're going to dive in here. First Kings chapter 22, we're going to start out by looking at verses 1 to 3. When you get there, you can say amen. Just 
Let me give you a little background here. There's peace in the land of Israel, but King Ahab doesn't want peace. He wants war. More particularly, he wanted Ramoth Gilead. Now, Ramoth Gilead had been portioned to the Israelites as part of the, the inheritance of the tribe of Gad. It was one of the cities of refuge. But uh, um, the Syrians had come and they had taken Ramoth Gilead away, and Ahab wanted it back. He wanted Ramoth Gilead just like he wanted Naboth's vineyard. Now, the king of Syria had lost some wars to Ahab already, and in 1 Kings chapter 20, he had promised to give back all the cities to Ahab. But he didn't. He never kept his promise. So Ahab wants to go to war. He wants to get Ramoth, Ramoth Gilead back. But he needs some help in order to do it. 1 Kings 22, verse 1. Now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servants, do you know that Ramoth Gilead is ours? But we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. So, just to help us understand, this is the time of the divided kingdom. After Solomon, uh, the kingdom had split into the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of uh, Judah. And Ahab was um, perhaps the most wicked and notorious of a long line of despot kings in the northern kingdom. In fact, he and his wife Jezebel became synonymous with evil and wicked and cruelty and idolatry. Jehoshaphat, on the other hand, was one of only five kings in the southern kingdom who was known to be a man who sought after God and his ways. So what was Jehoshaphat doing in Samaria with Ahab? Well, Chronicles tells us that Jehoshaphat had married his son to the daughter of Jezebel and Ahab. Jehoram had married Atalia, and this had bonded the two kingdoms together. Jehoshaphat wanted to make peace, but the problem was, it's one thing to make peace with somebody, it's another thing to be their close friend. Jehoshaphat goes to the kingdom, Ahab wines and dines him, Chronicles tells us, because he needs Jehoshaphat's help to go fight against the king of Syria. Jehoshaphat agrees and says, sure, my people are your people, we'll do this together. And then, almost as an afterthought, he thinks, well, wait a minute. He makes the commitment, but then he thinks, well, we better go find out what the Lord wants to do. And so he asks Ahab if they can consult God. Picking it up in verse 4. So he said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people are as your people, my horses as your horses. Also, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? You see, these prophets that Ahab had summoned, they weren't actually prophets of Baal or Ashtaroth. Those had all been killed on Mount Carmel when Elijah had this showdown between God and Baal. These were prophets that were supposedly prophets of the God Yahweh. But in the northern kingdom, that meant they were primarily prophets of the calf that Jeroboam had set up, this golden image, this idol. And they, these were hired guns for the king to put their rubber stamp, a divine seal of approval, on what the king wanted. And what the king wanted was Ramoth Gilead. So that's what they said. Go! Go fight! The Lord will give it into your hand. God will be with you. God will bless you and your plans 
it will all be well. But Jehoshaphat knows better. He knows that just because there are 400 doesn't, might doesn't make right. Numbers doesn't determine what is good and correct and true. And so he says, isn't there at least one true prophet? I don't need 400 true prophets. Just one to say what God thinks. Well, there was, but Ahab didn't like him. Verse 8, So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man, Micaiah the son of Imlah, but whom, by whom we may require of the Lord, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me. Ahab says, I don't even bother to invite him because he's not going to tell me what I want to hear. I hate him because he speaks words that are against my desires and my inclinations. And Joseph had said, wait a minute. The king shouldn't be saying such things. You're supposed to be the moral example and leader of this nation. You, you should be uh, listening to the prophets. You should be following what they say. So reluctantly, Ahab says, okay, bring in Micaiah. Tells his servants to do it quickly. Micaiah is brought in. While they're waiting for Micaiah, Zedekiah, another false prophet, uh, comes and he puts horns on his head and he says, with these horns, you're going to gore the Syrians. You will be victorious. And then when Micaiah arrives, he's told what he needs to do. Mike, can you hit, um, remind me later, on that computer screen. First Kings 22.12 says, Now listen, the words of the prophet with one accord encourage the king. Therefore, please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. Micaiah has given his marching orders. He's, he's told 400 other prophets have encouraged the king. And you need to do the same. You need to say what the king wants to hear. You are brought here not to speak what is right, not to speak God's words. You are brought here to put a stamp of approval on what King Ahab wants to do. Now think about it. If Ahab is so determined to go to Ramoth Gilead, if he's so determined to fight this war, why even consult the prophets in the first place? Why not just do what he wants to do and be done with it? Well, you see, I think Ahab brought the prophets there not so that they would speak truth, but so that they would ease conscience and justify what he was already planning to do. Because sometimes we want to do something we know we shouldn't, and there's something inside of us that tells us to stop, and we want someone else to tell us, go ahead and do it anyway. We want someone else to ease that voice, to justify that action. And so for, the, for this purpose, Ahab has brought the prophets to him and told them, put the words in their mouth what he wants them to prophesy. Now, by the way, this isn't just a phenomenon that happened 2,800 years ago. In his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, Paul says to Timothy, he says, there are going to be uh, people who heap up for themselves preachers who speak after their own lusts. He said they're going to have itching ears and they're going to find for themselves people who will not speak truth, who won't speak what is right, but will speak exactly what they want to hear so they can feel justified in doing what they want to do. And Paul's admonition to Timothy is he says, Timothy, 
Jesus Christ is going to one day judge the living and the dead. Therefore, you preach the word. He says, don't worry about what the people think. Don't worry about what their opinions are, because ultimately they're not your judge. Jesus Christ is going to be your judge. So speak His words. And that's exactly what Micaiah intends to do. They tell him what he's supposed to say, but he's not having any of it. He says, as the Lord lives, whatever my God says, that is what I will speak. Not what Ahab says, not what the other prophets say, not what you want to hear. What God says is what I will speak. And make no mistake, Biblical prophets stood out. In fact, you might even say it was embarrassing to be a prophet. They couldn't just blend in with those around them. They couldn't just be like the 400 other prophets who said that everything was going to be okay. They couldn't just be like the other pretenders predicting peace and prosperity, offering cheerful words, and telling everyone else just to relax. And let your conscience take it easy. No, the biblical prophets predicted consequences and judgment and disaster. While others said sin was no big deal, the biblical prophets were horrified at things that went on every day around them. The daily life of the people around them, the the, the common culture, not just the, the outlandish things, but the common things to the biblical prophets were horrendous and unacceptable. And they would make a big deal about the cruelty and lust and oppression and greed that was prevalent in the world around them. To the callous world, the prophet seemed out of touch and extreme, harsh and relentless, even small-minded. You see, modern thought tends to diminish responsibility and magnify circumstances and human weakness. We, in our modern world, find it difficult to isolate the deed from the circumstances in which it's done. And therefore, guilt isn't as sharp. Our consciences are full of self-pity. We make excuses. We sympathize with weakness, but not the biblical prophet. For them, there was no excuse for sin. Man was responsible. Sin was dreadful. And though their messages were often poetic, they usually weren't pleasant because they weren't the words that people wanted to hear. They preached, as one theologian put it, one octave too high for most people's ears. It just kind of grated on people and what they wanted to do and the way they wanted to live. The prophets rejected modern and tame morality. The moral status quo was not acceptable to them. And though you could reject the prophet's words. They said it in a way, they proclaimed it with such boldness and such ferociousness that even though you could reject it, you could not ignore it. So Micaiah says, "Uh uh-uh. My job isn't to tell Ahab what he wants to hear. My job is to say what God wants to say. And what follows is perhaps the most sarcastic verse in all of Scripture. Every time I read this, it just smiles. It brings a smile to my face. Micaiah goes to Ahab and says, Ahab, go and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Now notice, he is saying exactly what the other 400 prophets have already said said. But I think he was saying it in a way that the message was clear. Ahab, this is what you want to hear, let me tell you. Go and prosper. 
The Lord's going to deliver it into the hand of the king. And by the way, Micaiah doesn't mention which king the Lord's going to deliver it into the hand of. He doesn't say it's going to be delivered into your hand. He says the Lord is going to deliver it into the hand of the king. Well, Ahab, he's frustrated and flustered at this time. He didn't even want Micaiah there in the first place. And he says, how many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Now, is that really what Ahab wanted to hear? He never made Micaiah tell him, uh, to swear to tell him the truth. He told Micaiah what to say before Micaiah even opened his mouth. Ahab was not interested in the truth. He was interested in what he wanted. So Micaiah says, Well, Ahab, if it's the truth you want, let me tell you what it is. He said, I saw in a vision all of Israel scattered like sheep because their shepherd was smitten. I saw the Lord on a throne. And the Lord said, Ahab is determined to go to war. Who's going to give him the excuse that he so wants? And a lying spirit spoke up. He said, I will. I'll give him his excuse. I'll give him his reason. I'll go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And God said, let it be done. Ahab was furious when Micaiah spoke the truth. He orders him to be imprisoned. The other prophets berate Micaiah. And Ahab says, when I come back in peace, then you can get out of prison. And Micaiah said, you're not coming back in peace. He was not expecting to leave that prison cell. Let's read what happens. 1 Kings 22, 29. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. So did they listen to Micaiah? And here's the crazy thing about this. is not just that Ahab goes up to Ramoth Gilead, but Jehoshaphat does too. Ahab knew better but Jehoshaphat really knew better. Jehoshaphat knew that Micaiah was a prophet of the Lord. He heard what Micaiah said. But he so wants to please Ahab. He wants to be the nice guy after all. That he goes up anyway. Verse 30. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, get this. I will disguise myself and go into the battle. But you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Ahab is a little bit nervous. Maybe there was some truth to what Micaiah said. Maybe the king is going to be killed. Well, if that's so, let it be Jehoshaphat. Let him be the big, obvious target in his royal robes, and I'll hide myself, and I'll get through this battle, and I'll get Ramoth Gilead, and who cares what happens to Jehoshaphat? With friends like that, who needs enemies, right? And, and, and by the way, isn't it true that so often our peers and what they want, and what they desire, and what they think, and what they say, can completely nullify what God wants, and what God desires, and what He says. So Jehoshaphat knows better, goes to battle, keeps his robes on, and Ahab disguises himself. Verse 31. Now the king of Syria had commanded the 32 captains of his chariot, saying, Fight with no one small or great, but only with the king of Israel. So go after Ahab. So it was when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat, they, th they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. Therefore they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out. 
And it happened when the captains of the chariot saw that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor, so that he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and take me out of the battle, for I am wounded. The battle increased that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot, facing the Syrians, and died at evening. The blood ran out from the wound onto the floor of the chariots. Then as the sun was going down, a shout went throughout the army, saying, Every man to his city and every man to his own country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. Then someone washed the chariot at a pool in Samaria, and the dog looked up with blood while the harlots bathed, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken. Ahab was determined to do what he wanted to do. And there was ultimately a consequence. He could fool Jehoshaphat, but he couldn't fool God. And brothers and sisters, this same tale has been repeated throughout the history of, of humanity many times over. Men and women over and over again choose to believe in a God of their own making because it is more suitable, it is easier, it's more pleasant, and it doesn't require as much. We treat our consciences, we treat the Word of God like Micaiah, Throw them in prison, put them in a corner, get them out of the way, and let's find some religion, let's find some prophets that tell us what we want to hear, that tell us what we want to think, and don't demand nearly so much. And so we fool ourselves. But the truth is, we only fool ourselves and no one else. You just simply have to look at a history of religion in this world to see that it is filled with men's ideas and men's desires and men's thoughts rather than God and His ways. 2 Thessalonians, turn with me there. Before Paul before Paul was killed, martyred, in a number of places he tried to warn the church of what was coming. In Acts 20, he warned them that wolves would come in and lead people astray. And here in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, we're going to start with verse 3. When you get there, you can say amen. He's warning them about man-made religion. Choosing your own truth rather than God's. This is what he says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, meaning the second coming, will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So he says, Be clear. The second coming of Jesus Christ is not going to happen unless there's this falling away. And he doesn't just say a falling away. He says the falling away. And the word he uses in Greek is apostasia. And and literally, it means a defection or a turning from the truth. Now keep in mind here, he's not writing this to outsiders. This is a letter to the church. And he's saying... There's going to be this falling away, this turning away from the truth. And where's it going to happen? He said, right there in God's church. 
This man of sin is going to exalt himself. He's going to sit in the temple of God. Exalts himself as if he were God. Notice the last part here. Verse 9. The coming of the lawless one, this man of sin who sits in the temple of God, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the what? Truth. Because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Notice the similarity with Ahab's story. It's the people who don't love the truth. And so God, because they don't love the truth, He allows this strong delusion to come to them, gives them the excuse that they're looking for. They turn from the truth. They believe the lie. And ultimately, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is a way of death. And church history played all of this out, didn't it? You just look at the Middle Ages. You look at what was proclaimed as truth. It was proclaimed as, as, as divine. And it was what men wanted and how they wanted it. And it justified what they wanted to do and the power that they wanted to attain. And it had nothing to do with God and His unchanging Word. So here, here's the message of all of this. This is what it all boils down to. Don't believe everything you think. Don't believe everything you feel. Just because you think it, and just because you feel it, doesn't make it truth. Don't believe everything you hear. Don't believe everything you see. Just because you hear it, just because you see it, does not make it truth. The Bible says that your heart and my heart is deceitfully wicked. Meaning, the easiest person on this planet for me to fool is myself. And unfortunately, so often... We use religion to do just that. We use religion to fool ourselves, and then we can relax in the safety and comfort of our own delusions. But brothers and sisters, we must let the prophets speak. We must let God's word ring in our ears and make a difference in our heart and actually change the things that we think and the things that we say and the things that we do. If when we pick up the scripture, and I'm not talking about just ignoring the scripture, but if when we pick it up, we only find a corroboration of what we already think and what we already feel and what we're already doing, you can be pretty assured that there's a whole lot of man-made religion rattling around in your brain. Because in the Scriptures, if we actually listen to the prophets, if we actually hear what they're saying, we come up against a God who is so different than you and I. A God who, by the way, the Bible says is unchangeable, whose love is so beyond us, who, who, who is a God who, who hates sin more than we can imagine, who, who is so desperate to be with us that, that nothing else matters to Him. When we come up against that God with our true selves, we should change. We 
should be conformed and molded and shaped by who he is. And if we're not, if the God we worship, if the God we believe in is not causing us to change, I would venture to say he's not the God of heaven. He's a God of our own choosing and our own devising and our own making. He's a God that seems safe to worship and follow, but ultimately those false gods, those man-made gods, are more dangerous than you and I can imagine. It's not God that needs to change, is it? It's you and I. It's you and I. And the only way that we will ultimately come to the place where we will surrender what we hold on to so t tightly, the only place that we will ultimately, the only way we will ultimately come to the place where we will change ourselves is to see God for who He really is. To see God in His beauty and in His majesty and His awesomeness and His power. To see God in His love. To see Jesus Christ on the cross and allow the reality, the ultimate reality of God to come up against the ultimate reality of ourselves and bring about change. I'm going to invite our worship leaders to come. In just a moment, we're going to sing our closing song, uh, Change My Heart, O God. And, and as, as we get ready to sing, I just want us to... My appeal is for you to do some self-evaluation. For us all to have some introspection. For us to allow God to search our hearts. And for God to put His finger on ways that we have fashioned Him after our own image. And to allow Him to change who we are in the way that we think about Him. Let's stand together as we sing, Change My Heart, O oh God.
Heavenly Father, we truly ask that you would not just change us, not just change our hearts, but first, Lord, show us our own hearts. The truth is, Lord, that often we pick and choose what to believe. Maybe we, maybe we make you more severe so that we can justify being severe with others. Or maybe we, we make you apathetic so we can relax and just go ahead and do what we want. But we try to mold you into our image or the image of the culture around us. And Lord, what we're left with is not uh, you. It's not God. It's this, this idol in our own hands. So Lord, may we have the courage to throw them away. To hear you for what you are really saying. To let your words, to let your Bible determine what we believe and shape who we are. Change our hearts, O oh God. Make them ever true. Change our hearts, O oh God. May we be like you. Because you alone are worthy. You are love. You are goodness. You are everything that ultimately we want and desire. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.